can start. Good morning, everyone. Um, well, let, let's wait for Ms. Tashera to return. Good morning, everyone. Not, not yet, not yet, not yet. <laughs> you can maybe turn up your... Good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome everyone to the hearing number 33 on our last day of period of sessions, this 191st period. And uh, my name is Roberta Clark, and I'm the chair of uh, the commission for the time being, and also the Rapporteur for Women's Rights, as well as the Rapporteur for the Rights of LGBTI Persons. The title of this hearing is Impacts of Gender-Based Violence on Migrant Women, Sex Workers, and transgender, uh, and transgender women in Guyana. The, the hearing was requested by Synergia Initiatives, Initiatives for Human Rights and Guyana Equality Forum. Um, and I would like to welcome representatives of civil society and also representatives of the state, Ambassador Hines, uh, Minister Teixeira, and your team in Guyana. Uh, we look forward to a, 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 a productive and constructive exchange. The purpose of this hearing, as articulated by the requesters, is to present information on violence faced by women in vulnerable situations such as trans women, migrants, and sex workers, highlighting intersectional factors that affect them and the barriers they face in accessing justice, health, and services. Um, with that, I would just like to see how we're going to organize the time. Civil society organizations, you have 20 minutes. Um, the state has the same amount of time, 20 minutes, and so does the commission, but if we take less time, commissioners, the mm -hmm. civil society and the state get more time to have the interaction. Um, and then uh, we turn back to civil society. We may have to cut down on the time because of our start, but so far it's about, let's say, t 10 minutes, and state also 10 minutes, so maybe, um, well, let's stick with the 12 minutes and see where we get. 12 minutes for civil society, 12 minutes for the, uh, for the state. And with that, I would like to invite civil society organizations to begin your 20 minutes, and the clock is on the screen, and we would like you to pay attention to it. Thank you very much, and over to you. Thank you very much, Madam Commissioner. Now, it is, first of all, uh, my apologies for a tardiness in terms of what happened a little bit earlier. Now, it is indeed a great pleasure for me, Chandrawadi Prasad, to appear before this commission, uh, the, the applicant's synergia, and uh, for me to lead our delegation of the GF member associations, which comprise of Blossom Inc., represented by Dr. Adeli Dargetti Dean, Ghana Sex Workers Coalition, represented by Ms. Kanisha Tom, who is the third, second person from my right, and uh, lastly, Sasot Ghana, represented by Ms. Twinkle Paul. Now we express our heartfelt appreciation to the IACHR and Synergia for affording these Guyanese organizations this opportunity to present our issues on the impacts of gender violence affecting particular groups of marginalized women in Guyana. This hearing will focus on the current situation of murder and violence committed against migrant women, women who are sex workers and transgender women, and the impacts of this gendered violence in the Guyanese context. Now, it is established under many efforts on gender, gender violence, specific to Guyana, including reports from the United Nations and the World Bank, have confirmed that violence against women is alarmingly pervasive in Guyana, notwithstanding the multi-agency interventions thus far. The impact of violence on this group is profound, affecting women's physical, mental, psychological, and social well-being, and hindering their ability to participate meaningfully in their respective communities and the society at large. The landmark case of Maria de Pena, the a US uh, case, have set significant legal standards for the protection of women's rights within the member states. 
that case highlighted the state's obligation to act with due diligence in preventing, investigating, and punishing violence against women. It enforces that effective measures are needed to prosecute and punish the aggressor. But similarly, Jessica's case, which is another US case, underscored the fa failure of the state to protect individuals from domestic violence, which led to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights finding the US government responsible for human rights violations. And closer to home is a case, the well-established case, or known case of Quincy McKeown in the year 2018, um, which has set out the rights of transgender persons who may be affected by violence and abuse meted out to them and the responsibility of the courts in Guyana to afford them the protection of the law. Now, the rights of all women include a right to live free from violence and discrimination, and much more is laid out in the regional and international human rights instruments for migrant women. These include addressing the intersection of race, gender, and migration status to improve access to justice and human rights protection. For transgender women, it involves transcending the gender binary delineated by the limitation of domestic laws, advancing health-related human rights, acknowledging their gender identity and expression as integral to individual dignity and common humanity. The Inter-American Court's decision reinforces that proactive measures are required to prevent violence, facilitate justice and reparations to victims, and ensure non-reputation. This commitment is further supported by conventions, uh, which the Guyana government has ratified and directly incorporated into our constitution. It specifically addresses the need to combat violence against women and establish legal mechanisms for their protection. Upholding these rights is not just about legal redress, but also about societal transformation to eradicate gender-based violence and discrimination, ensuring that all women can live in dignity and equality. The petition and organizations value the report of the Commission on Violence and Discrimination Against Women, Girls, and Adolescents, Good Practices and Challenges in Latin America and the Caribbean, as published in November 19, 2019. The report, this report serves as a call to action for member states to adopt and strengthen measures to prevent, punish, and eradicate violence and discrimination against women and girls. I now invite Ms. Ayodhali Dagati Dean to make her presentation. Thank you, Chanjavati. Honorable commissioners, attendees, listeners, good day to you all. At least since 2020, Guyana has seen a significant influx of migrants, especially women and girls, fleeing the socioeconomic and political crisis in Venezuela. Blossom Inc., a leading non-government organization in Guyana, has provided critical support to this vulnerable population. The services have helped Venezuelan women and girls who have faced extreme violence, including sexual and gender-based violence, particularly in the hinterland regions of Guyana. Blossom Inc. data reveals a sharp increase in the number of sexual and gender-based violence cases amongst Venezuelan migrants over the past five years, with a total of 307 recorded cases between 2020 and mid-2024. The escalation in violence is particularly pronounced in Region 7, where 174 cases were reported. This area, heavily associated with mining activities, is a hotspot for exploitation and trafficking due to its transient population and limited law enforcement presence. Additionally, forensic interviews conducted with 41 migrant children between 2020 and 2024 shows the intergenerational impact of violence. These children, many of whom were direct victims or witnesses to violent acts against their mothers or sisters, often exhibit trauma-related symptoms, further complicating their integration into Guyanese society. Commissioners, the voices of the women supported by Blossom Inc. reflect the devastating impacts of violence on their lives. Beneficiary AA shared, I left Venezuela thinking I would find safety here in Guyana, but what I found was worse. I was promised work in the mining camps, but I was forced into prostitution. I was beaten, and when I tried to resist, and when I tried to go to the authorities, they treated me like I didn't belong here. This harrowing account illustrates the exploitation faced by many migrant women who are being trafficked in the interior regions of Guyana. It also highlights the compounded difficulties of sexual and gender-based violence and xenophobic treatment, where victims are met with hostility from local authorities and communities. Beneficiary AB, 
during a special victim forensic interview, described her experience. The fear of reporting the violence was too much. I had no papers, and I was scared I would be sent back to Venezuela. The abuse I suffered was too much to bear, but I had no one to turn to. This testimony highlights the compounded vulnerabilities of undocumented migrant women who, due to their lack of legal status, are often too afraid to seek help from authorities, leaving them trapped in a cycle of violence. Another beneficiary, Beneficiary BC, during case management, described her experience with discrimination. It wasn't just the violence, it was how people treated us like we didn't deserve help because we were Venezuelan. When I went to report the abuse, they asked why I didn't stay in my country. It made me feel like I didn't have the right to be safe. This testimony shows how xenophobia not only heightens the psychological distress faced by migrant women, but also prevents them from accessing crucial support and justice. Commissioners, several socioeconomic factors contribute to the heightened risk of violence against migrant women and girls. Among the most significant are economic exploitation and trafficking, lack of legal protections, cultural and language barriers, and here it's very crucial that during an interview with a Blossom staffer, she said language is a huge barrier. Many of the women don't understand the legal processes, and without translation, they feel lost and powerless. And four, of course, is the weak border controls and law enforcement gaps due to the porous borders between Guyana and Venezuela. Blossom Inc. has been at the forefront of addressing the violence faced by migrant women, providing vital services such as trauma counseling, forensic interviews, psychosocial support, and legal assistance. Women who've accessed Blossom services have expressed deep gratitude for the support they received. One survivor shared, Blossom helped me regain my strength. This gave me a safe space, and for the first time, I felt heard and protected. But despite these efforts, Blossom Inc. faces significant challenges particularly in extending their reach to remote regions where many victims reside. Limited resources and the vast geographical scope of their migration route means that many migrant women remain unassisted. Honorable Commissioner, the rising incidence of violence against migrant women in Guyana, particularly in regions one, two, and seven, calls for urgent and coordinated interventions. The testimonies from the women highlight not only physical harm they endure, but also the emotional and psychological toll that violence has taken on them and their families. I must emphasize the need for enhanced legal protections, improved law enforcement presence in vulnerable regions, and the expanded support services. Additionally, the significant number of reports overall over the four-year period is an indicator of a broader societal issue that requires attention and action. The data highlights the importance of addressing violence against migrant women and the need for protective measures and support systems. Now I'll hand over to my colleague, Kanisha Combe. Thank you. I Honorable commissioners, attendees, and listeners. The Guyana Sex Work Coalition has been working with sex workers and advocating for the rights of sex workers in Guyana since 2008. Sex workers have been stigmatized and discriminated for as long as we can remember. The places where they seek refuge and justice are the places they face discrimination the most. These injustices pervade because the legal framework is misinterpreted unhelpful and fuel stigma and discrimination against sex workers. For example, sections 165 and 166 of the Summary Jurisdi Jurisdiction Offenses Act Chapter 0802 of the Laws of Guyana criminalize conduct of sex work. The criminal conducts include being a male living off the earnings of prostitution, soliciting sex in a public place and loitering in a public place for the purpose of prostitution. As a result, when visiting police stations, the police refuse to take reports of violence from sex workers, which leads to impunity for perpetrators and results in sex workers losing trust in the justice system. Over the years, there have been several cases of violence against cisgendered women, transgendered women, and migrants who engage in sex work. In many of these instances, 
sex workers were killed in the most gruesome manner. Stabbing, mutilation, disposal of their bodies in public places. As a result, they remain vulnerable to targeted violence, physical and sexual abuse, and even human trafficking. In the Regional Refugee and Migrant Response Plan 2023 to 2024, the Interagency Coordination Platform for Refugees and Migrants from Venezuela noted that sex workers experience serious human rights violations and exploitation, which places them among the most vulnerable population. Likewise, a 2019 report by the IAHCR emphasizes the compounded nature of discrimination faced by women who are additionally marginalized due to race, sexual orientation, or gender identity. Specifically, the IACHR report states, violence and discrimination do not affect all women equally, Afro-descendant, indigenous, lesbian, bisexual, trans, and intersex women are subjected to layers of violence and discrimination that intersect with their gender. The recent killings of Mira Carmen Rodriguez Serrano and Sean Simon Hooper concurs with the findings of both reports aforementioned. Serrano, a Venezuelan migrant woman, woman, tragically lost her life in July 2024 due to violence. The incident involved a refusal to perform unpaid services leading to a fatal altercation. Simon, an Afro-Guyanese transgender woman, tragically lost her life in an execution-styled killing in Guyana's capital city, Georgetown, while on duty as a sex worker. The reason for her death is unknown thus far. In addition, GSWC reported 27 instances of gender-based violence in the year 2023 alone, highlighting the ongoing challenges faced by sex workers. These incidents underscore the broader context of violence that's, that disproportionately affect marginalized groups and reflect critical needs for urgent legal reforms of sections 165 and 166 of the Summary Jurisdiction Offenses Act, Chapter 0802. Together with protections and advocacy focused on the rights of sex workers in Guyana. I'll hand you over to you. Honorable Commissioners, attendees, state, part state parties, representatives of the state, listeners, good day to you all. I'm happy that this commission recognized and afforded the GEF the opportunity to highlight the impacts of violence against marginalized women. Specifically, in my community, violence against transgender Guyanese women leads to homelessness, drives migration, creates a lack of education, and contributes to unemployment. Today, I share the story of Granny, an Afro-Guyanese transgender woman who survived on the fringes of Guyana society and built a family home. In February 2023, Granny's brother attacked her in that very home. Since March 2023, that matter has been before the local magistrate court without a trial date. Sometime between May 2023, Granny's brother lodged a false report against her. She was detained for 24 hours, charged, and again placed before the court. On that occasion, the magistrate ordered Granny to stay 200 feet away from her brother, although they reside in the same home. Ironically, Granny made reports against her brother for threatening behavior, but the police failed to investigate the reports until the trans community protested the police on May 30th, 2023. In fear of another false charge, Granny left the home and effectively became homeless. Given her new homeless reality, an attorney at law, at no cost, wrote the Ministry of Housing and Water, explained the situation, and pleaded for an expedition of Granny's 2022 housing application. However, Granny received no response to the pleas of the attorney at law. Granny's case alone exhibits how anti-gender violence affects trans women in Guyana. One impact is a prolonged course of, to seek justice in the local court system. Another is the failure of the judicial system to provide effective remedies to victims of violence, especially trans women. This manifests itself as a lack of or unequal protection of the law for trans women in Guyana. In Granny's case, this violence also leads to a displacement and homelessness, while the Ministry of Housing and Water and executive arm of the government provided absolutely no response despite Granny's homeless situation. 
Violence against trans women drives migration. Honorable Commission, over the years, Sasa Guyana has supported many trans women fleeing violence in Guyana. From 2018 to now, there are at least 40 trans women from Guyana seeking safety in, the, in Europe and here in the United States. On July 11, 2024, Sean Simon was murdered, an afro guyanese transgender woman. Two weeks prior, I spoke to Kyle Bartle and she confided, I'm getting up my money to travel. Travel meant she was going to seek asylum in another country. Unfortunately, she didn't make it out. Catalina Homer, who is currently in the Netherlands, was shot in the pelvic region on April 8, 2021. I myself, from 2011 to 2018, was beaten by the police while advocating for my community and ordered out of a local magistrate court for women female attire. Also, I've been the victim of transphobic hate crimes on numerous occasions in Guyana. I endured these unlawful acts of violence with no redress despite engaging the justice system. Equally, I migrated for safety. Transphobic violence in school creates a lack of education. In 2023, a high school student was assaulted by a classmate and verbally abused by a teacher who said, I'm not teaching no anti-man, a derogatory term for gays or transgender people. After the student posted the situation on Facebook, the ministry intervened, but the outcome was unknown. To date, we don't know if the ministry take any actions to um, prevent a further occurrence of this situation. Structural violence contributes to unemployment for transgender women. A report titled Trap in Cycles of Violence and Discrimination Against LGBTQ People in Guyana, produced by the Georgetown University Human Rights Institute, highlights the absence of specific prohibitions on discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. To analyze the impact of this structural violence against transgender people, Sasset Guyana and Guyana Trans United conducted a qualitative study which found that a majority of trans people experience discrimination when looking for jobs. Moreover, when in jobs, participants reported less pay, victimization, being questioned on issues unrelated to performance, having no acknowledgement of their work, and being fired without just cause. Therefore, the lack of protection against sexual orientation and gender identity-based discrimination contributes to hostile work environments and unfair practices in the labor market, which is attributed to extremely high unemployment rates, especially among trans women. Sasa Guyana has documented 69 instances of abuse against trans women from 2018 to 2022, indicating a significant prevalence in such incidents. Thank you for, those. Thank you for your presentations. Um, we, we have a few recommendations, numbering 10 and those uh, include strengthening legal protections for migrants, expansion of law enforcement in vulnerable regions, improve access to services, cross-border cooperation, reform all legal provisions which affect the rights of transgender people, migrants, and sex workers to confirm with international law treaties and established court decisions, enforce the constitutional rights to housing, education, employment, and equal protection before the law for transgender Guyanese provide support to the NGOs, and enforce international, regional, and constitutional rights of every citizen, regardless of race, gender, and immigration status. Uh, intentionally strengthen the access to hold uh, Judy Bears accountable for mistreatment towards migrants. And lastly, to take immediate steps to legislate for explicit protections against stigma dis and discrimination to include transgender people, migrants, and sex workers. We thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think you should give us that list uh, because it went so quickly. <laughs> Um, but uh, so we expect that you can give us that list of certainly, useful. Certainly. And now we'll turn over to the representatives of the state for your 20 minutes, Ambassador Hines, uh, Minister Tishera, over to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Madam President of the IACHR and members of the IACHR, members of the CSO delegation here, and of course the Ambassador for Guyana in Washington. I'm pleased to be here before the ISHR to advise the ISHR on what are the efforts being made in Guyana to reduce violence against all women, including sex workers, transgender, and migrants. Guyana is proud of the significant progress that's been made in addressing violence against women, including the most vulnerable groups, such as sex workers, transgender persons, and migrants. Recognizing the unique challenges faced by these groups, the state party has worked tirelessly to ensure they receive equal protection, support, and access to justice. 
Importantly, I should emphasize that the legislative protections and the range of services provided are not limited to any specific group. Both nationals and non-nationals are entitled to the full range of protections and essential services available. This inclusive approach underscores the state's unwavering commitment to upholding the rights and dignity of all women, regardless of their identity, nationality, or background. In recent years, the state has taken concrete actions to address domestic violence, support vulnerable communities, address stigma and discrimination, on co and combat trafficking in persons. While these efforts have been ongoing for decades, in the past five years alone, the state, through its various arms, has implemented a range of legislative, policy, and institutional reforms aimed at strengthening its approach to gender-based violence, including the passage of the new, new Family Violence Act on July 31st, 2024, ongoing revision to the Sexual Offenses Act, strengthened interagency collaboration, created special programs to address the needs of migrants from Venezuela, increase and expand sensitization awareness campaigns, particularly in remote areas, involved communities and civil society organizations, and created special units within the Ghana Police Force to handle cases of domestic and gender-based violence, to name only a few. Of note, Ghana was, <clears throat> was recognized by the Trinidad-based Caribbean Court of Justice for being the first country in the English-speaking Caribbean to establish a sexual offenses court in 2017. The passage of the Family Violence Act of 2024 represents a pivotal advancement in the legal framework for combating domestic violence, offering a comprehensive and progressive approach to safeguarding victims of domestic and gender-based violence. This landmark legislation, which arose out of consultation with civil society, provides an expansive and inclusive definition of family violence, thereby broadening the scope of protection and support. It fortifies legal safeguards, augments support services, and places a significant emphasis on preventive measures. In repealing the Domestic Violence Act of 1996, this new legislation introduced innovative provisions that extend legal protection to cohabiting couples, regardless of marital status, as well as to same-sex couples within the LGBTQ plus communities thus ensuring a more inclusive and equitable legal environment for all. The Ministry of Human Services and Social Security continues to provide comprehensive support for victims of gender-based violence through key initiatives, such as the Survivor Advocate Program and the Hope and Justice Centers. These programs offer critical assistance, including legal support, crisis counseling, and safe shelter for survivors of violence. The ministry's support is inclusive, extending to all women, regardless of nationality or gender identity, and includes specialized services for LGBTQI plus individuals. In 2023, 69 transgender women accessed gender-based violence services, highlighting the ministry's commitment to addressing the unique needs of marginalized groups. Additionally, the Looking Glass Awareness Campaign continues to engage sex workers and their clients, promoting awareness around trafficking and violence prevention. This ongoing work reflects the Ministry's commitment to strengthening protection, protection mechanisms and ensuring that all survivors of GBV have access to the resources and support they need to build their lives inclusive of migrants. The Legal Aid Clinic of Ghana, which represents persons who cannot afford uh, legal support, um, increased budget was increased um, from, nine, from 30 million in 2018 to 92 million in 2023. This is part of the commitment of the government to support these NGOs to help in the struggle to reduce violence. The Legal Pro Bono 500 Initiative provides essential free legal services to victims of gender-based violence, ensuring that no one is excluded from access to justice due to that, their identity or status. This includes support for non-nationals, transgender individuals, and members of the LGBTQI community, and ensures, that they're, and ensures that they're not denied justice because of financial barriers or discrimination. 
To date, over 5,000 individuals have benefited from le free legal advice and assistance. The state has established a three-digit toll-free hotline, 914, to strengthen efforts in addressing gender-based violence. The hotline is equipped to receive reports of child abuse, domestic violence, and sexual abuse. All reports of domestic violence are promptly forwarded to survivor advocates and or probation officers for follow-up. These follow-up services include crisis counseling, court support, assistance with shelter, food, job placement, and other vital resources to support survivors. IMATA GY app, a national gender-based violence app, was developed as a central online portal to provide information on GBV essential services, laws, policies, resources, and a link to the national 914 GBV hotline service. This, these two the hotline and the IMATA GUI function and are used by the public and victims. To further strengthen the service, ongoing capacity building initiatives for staff are being implemented alongside increased awareness campaigns to promote the hotline services across all regions. The four open justice centers have been established to provide a broad range of vital services to victims of family violence, including legal assistance, counseling, and temporary shelter. The government of Ghana on June the 24, 2024, opened a Ghana agenda-based violence mobile remote, remote unit in one of the border regions to enhance the support for survivors of violence, including vulnerable migrant populations. The services, the essential services which are provided include intervention services um, with first responders, survivors advocates, and cases reporting services by, by police, as well as on-site medical assistance. Counseling and psychosocial support, legal support, shelter services, and community education awareness program to prevent GBV and promote gender equality. This initiative is a reflection of the broader government commitment to combating gender-based violence and discrimination by extending services into remote regions. By improving accessibility to protective resources, the government aims to support the health, safety, and rights of all residents, particularly those affected by violence and discrimination. The Child Advocacy Centers are operating in partnership with the Child Care Protection Agency, of the Ministry of Human Services and Social Security and managed by NGOs such as Childlink Inc. and Blossom Inc., which is present here today. These centers receive reports from child victims of abuse, conduct forensic interviews, and provide essential support services to not only children but also migrant communities. There are currently 14 operational child advocacy centers across the country. These centers provide a safe, child friendly, and neutral environment where child protection officers, law enforcement, medical personnel, victim support advocates, and other professionals collaborate to make decisions on the treatment, investigation, management, and prosecution of abuse cases. The two NGOs which manage these centers receive annual subventions from the government to support their work approved by the Parliament of Ghana. Over the past five years, these subventions have grown significantly. In 2024, Childleg received the equivalent in U.S. dollars of 197,680, while Blossom Inc. received the equivalent of U.S. dollars 285,319 dollars. These funds enable the NGOs to implement their vital programs, including providing support to migrant communities. It must be pointed out too that these NGOs also receive additional funding. From international bodies. This critical partnership provides Blossom Inc. with an opportunity to inform the Ministry of Human Services and Social Security, the agency responsible by the government for addressing gender-based violence and women's rights, about any alleged victim of gender-based violence, and to share statistical data on violence against women, allowing this and other relevant agencies to act swiftly and responsibly in situations involving victims. 
the use of data in this case provided to the ICHR or any other international organization is of question of value when this information has not been provided in country to the relevant authorities in a timely manner to ensure that first and foremost, the victims are urgently provided with the necessary, refer with the necessary referrals and assistance they need when these violations occur. The failure to do so delays critical intervention and support for victims, potentially jeopardizing their safety and well-being. Therefore, while the partnership with the ministry is valuable, the onus is on the NGOs, such as Blossom, to take immediate concrete actions that directly support the victims and facilitate timely responses from the appropriate agency. To not do so is to undermine the whole thrust in combating gender-based violence and the objective and primary objective of protecting the victims. Guyana has been a beneficiary of the Spotlight Initiative from 2020 to 2023. The EU-funded United Nations project saw Guyana receiving a, a contribution of 4.5 million euros over three years to invest in strategic and catalytic interventions to address the root causes and holistically address gender-based violence and family violence, employing innovative approaches involving state, government institutions, civil society organizations, communities, private sector, women, and women's movements. Blossom Inc. was one of the many CSO organizations that also benefit from the funding under the Spotlight Initiative to implement tailored grassroots projects aimed at eliminating violence against women and children. The Ministry of Human Services and Social Security works in collaboration with law enforcement agencies and non-governmental organizations to establish safe spaces, including shelters for victims of gender-based violence. In 2023, the ministry provided assistance to 363 victims of trafficking and gender-based violence, a significant portion of whom were non-Guyanese individuals. A notable initiative involves the integration of specialized sessions on domestic violence into the Guyana Police Force Training Academy. This training also includes modules on gender and sexual diversity developed and delivered in partnership with the Society Against Sexual Orientation Discrimination, SASOD, one of the CSO bodies here. Additionally, 16 gender-based violence units have been established within all regional divisions of the Guyana Police Force to investigate incidents. The COP Squad Initiative is a strategic collaboration between the Guyana's, Guyana's Ministry of Human Services, the Ministry of Home Affairs, and the Guyana Police Force, designed to bolster the capacity of law enforcement to address domestic violence and gender-based violence. By enhancing police expertise in these critical areas, the initiative aims to foster an efficient and victim-centered approach to law enforcement. We do recognize that there have been prejudices in the way in which the police have handled some of the cases referred to by the CSOs. However, a number of those cases are dated and that their strenuous efforts to buy these training programs with the police and the domestic violence unit to reduce the subjectivity and individual subjectivity of particular officers in the police force. The Constitution established Women and Gender Equality Commission, which is empowered to receive complaints under Article 212 JD of the Constitution of Guyana, reported that has not received any complaints related to gender-based violence involving migrants, sex workers, or transgender women. In the light of this, the State Party reaffirms the principle of exhausting domestic remedies prior to submitting alleged violations to international and regional bodies such as the ISHR. The state emphasizes that its legal and institutional mechanisms must be given the opportunity, whether it succeeds or fails, to operate effectively and address complaints within national framework before resorting to external oversight. The state has emphasized capacity building efforts focused on human trafficking, engaging vulnerable communities, civil society organizations, and migrant advocates. The Ministry of Home Affairs in January 2024 conducted a trafficking persons training session for 20 LGBTQ plus advocates from several organizations, and I can give the names of those organizations, 
that were participating, including SASAR. Furthermore, there was another training program, capacity training program with 35 civil society organizations and NGOs, including Blossom Inc., uh, Association of Haitian Nationals in Guyana, Catholic Char Charities Migrant Support Group, Humanity First Guyana, etc. Regarding healthcare, free universal healthcare is available to every, every person living in Guyana, regardless of race, ethnicity, religion, nationality, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. This applies to all LGBTQ plus persons, migrant women, sex workers, who all access a range of different services from various hospitals and health centers across Guyana. We have improved the access to HIV train, uh, treatment especially for vulnerable key populations by extending community-based care and support services. These efforts include offering free antiretroviral therapy to local health centers, mobile units, and outreach programs in remote areas, ensuring that everyone can access HIV care without stigma. The test and treatment policy, which was adopted in 2021, ensures that individuals who test positive for HIV receive immediate treatment, which is critical for effective viral management and the prevention of transmission, offering protection to key populations and vulnerable groups. The National AIDS Program Secretariat has engaged and continues to engage transgender and cisgender sex workers to ensure they have access to pre-exposure prophylaxis completely free. It should be noted that the government, this government, uh, took the to the National Assembly the Summary Jurisdiction Amendment Bill in 2021 to formally remove the sections which criminalize cross-dressing in keeping with the landmark 2018 ruling of the Caribbean Court of Justice. Regrettably, the former government did not do that. But regarding the murder of trans transgender sex worker Sean Simon Hooper, we are reporting a letter to the ISHR October 18th. This was a tragic murder that was handled expeditiously and without discrimination, underscoring the commitment of law enforcement and the judiciary to ensure equal access to justice for all citizens. Following the murder of Mr. Hooper on, on July 11, 2024, two suspects, Keem Fraser and Shaggy Mohammed, were quickly apprehended and charged and incarcerated. We must also emphasize here at this hearing that it should be noted that Ghana has become a host country to an estimated 40,000 Venezuelan migrants, approximately 5% of the state's present population, which means that we have adopted a humanitarian approach to offer free health and education, shelter, food, and non food support to the the migrants from Venezuela, who include also descendants from Guyana. We wish to recognize that the, to emphasize, sorry, that the humanitarian environment created by the government of Guyana for migrants from Venezuela has facilitated livelihood-based programs benefiting many migrants in various regions. This was the IOM 2023 publication on this by the Office of the Special Envoy for the regional response to the Venezuelan situation. In response to the migration, the issue of Venezuelan migrants, the government resuscitated and created the multi-agency, the multi-agency coordinating committee on the influx of migrants in 2021, which is led by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and meets quarterly. Thirteen government agencies and UN bodies are part of it. <clears throat> We have also looked at the multi-agency coordinating committee. There have been no reported incidents of sexual violence against the migrant population by the UN bodies that have been operating by the, within the migrant communities. And further, the UN resident coordinator on three occasions led a UN country team to visit two of the border regions in 2023 and 2024. So did the UN High Commission for Refugees office in Guyana visited the region in 2024, and neither UN body received reports of violence against migrants in general or migrant women. 
The total tabulation of domestic violence report in 2023, 13 victims were Venezuelan nationals and one Cuban, ranging in the age from 2023 to 67 years. In this instance, four charges have been laid with nine investigations. With regard to the tragic murder of Venezuelan sex worker Mira Carmen Rodriguez Serrano, this was swiftly addressed by the police who arrested the 25-year-old suspect within hours of the crime. The incident apparently stemmed from a personal disagreement following a night of socializing and drinking, suggested this too was an isolated case of interpersonal conflict rather than one of systematic and premeditated violence. Guyana, as you know, has held its, its tier one status with trafficking for the last eight years, and we continue to make efforts to reduce the level of trafficking in Guyana. Minister, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, um, but the time is up, and I see you have quite a few more pages. Um, <coughs> maybe we can uh, continue in the second session so we can have the uh, response of the commissioners uh, at this time. Thank you very oh. much, and again, apologies. Commissioner Bernal? Mm -hmm. Bueno, muchísimas gracias eh, a las personas de las… Oh, I'm so sorry, I'm going to speak in English. I'm, uh, I can't do it. <laughs> uh, we were in a hearing with Brazil, so I cannot speak Portuguese, and then I tried to speak in Spanish. Uh, thank you so much for uh, um, your courage on being here and presenting us with this information that is very valuable. I also would like to acknowledge the presence of the state, the remote presence of a minister, and then the imp very important delegation. I think that is something that we always value, uh, the presence and the, the willingness to hear, to listen, to engage in dialogue, and to cooperate. Um, of course, uh, we acknowledge that the problems that you present here I, uh, are of high importance. Uh, for the Commission and also for the system. And I have to acknowledge that we also value the information that the government is putting on the table on the different strategies, policy strategies and programs that, uh, are aim, that aim to address these problems. So I just want to uh, ask a question to the petitioners, uh, actually two questions. The, the first one is that Apart from government officials, uh, the um, violence that you report is coming from other sources. And uh, in the, if this is the case, what are those other so sources? And then my second question is, if you want to suggest some additional policies to the policies that the minister already presented. What would be those policies? Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Bernal. Commissioner Demis. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I join Commissioner Bernal in welcoming and his appreciation of the delegation of civil society who presented today, as well as the delegation of the state. I think both presentations are very, have been very important in giving some insight into the situation of gender-based violence in Guyana, and specifically how it impacts migrant women, sex workers, and trans women. What is interesting in these hearings of the commission, which we've had 32 yeah. for this week, we've seen the differences in, in the nature of the hearings. Some were continuous cases, other cases where, where we received information as a commission in terms of what the commission is still to still to do, still to pay attention to, or could pay attention to in terms of developing standards or norms. And this 
hearing is one where we, at least I hear very clearly that there is a need for more dialogue. Because as the civil society organizations presented their information, they presented what is taking place, how they record it, how they record or what they have recorded in terms of testimonies and experience and heard of victims. And on the other hand, we heard the state very clearly providing a panorama of the different policy strategies and initiatives that have taken place. And in all that, I also hear, if I think I listen very carefully, that there is some relationship between the state and civil society. But for me, this hearing brings to the forefront that there's still a deficit. And that deficit translates into victims, doesn't translate to in, I did this and you did that or you were supposed to know, it translates in victims of gender violence. And that is what we need to address in a very concerted way between the state and civil society. So in that regard, I have some questions. I think questions, a, a question that I would have <coughs> for the state and for civil society is what can be organized? How can state and civil society organizations better collaborate to address intersectional discrimination and gender violence faced by migrant women, trans women, and sex workers. What can be done? Have we thought about on the spectrum of the state and that of civil society, how can we better collaborate? Because there is some sort of collaboration, but it's, there's still a deficit. Um, also, maybe now specifically for civil society, what are the most pressing needs? Because in that dialogue, it needs to be clear what, what, are, what are the pressing needs? And what recommendations would you propose to the state in terms of state's initiatives that are now in place? Mm -hmm. And I think I have a question for the state. Maybe it was already addressed or it sh it's still to be addressed. I do not think that it was already addressed, but it had to do with the legislation that is now on the table. Um, and that has to do with the reasonable period of time clause in the Sexual Offenses Act. How does the state plan to address the potential barriers that the proposed reasonable period of time clause in the Sexual Offenses Act uh, amend might create for victims reporting sexual violence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Commissioner Denise. And now for my part, thanks to the, I want to join my co fellow commissioners in thanking the civil society organizations and the state here I think it is really true that Guyana has made a lot of policy progress. Um, uh, you know, with the, certainly the latest family violence law, but it's also one of the first, well, I, and thank you for the rem remembrance that it's the first country to have a sexual offenses court, but certainly also the first country to have a constitutional women and gender commission um, as well. So there, there, there's one thing here. My commissioner, my eloquent commissioner, Denise, talks about the deficits that translate into victims. I think what, what I take from that is that there is the, what I call the high politics of the state, which is where 
um, policies are elaborated, uh, where laws are passed, um, and with the state architecture for implementation. And then there's the deep politics of culture. And s culture sometimes follows law, sometimes culture shapes law. But it, it, it would be true, I think, in relation to gender-based violence everywhere, that the cultural transformations that we have been expecting with maybe 30 years, I think the guy in the law was in the first one in the 1990s, the first, um, the, first, the first iteration. The cultural transformation that we would have expected, I suppose 30 years later, is not really happening in the way it should happen. And oftentimes we feel let down by the institutions of the state, and in particular, I suppose, just j police who are on the front lines, police and courts are on the front lines of the protection mandate. Uh, police, of course, share, um, they share the, the, the stereotypes and that's trained out of them. And whilst I note there's been a lot of training um, in Guyana over many years, the fact is that police, some police, some police officers continue to, to have those stereotypes in their head which impede their, their delivery of service. I guess my question is, for me it's now more, and we have this conversation in the commission all the time, it's, it's about training, yes, and capacity building, yes, but it's also about accountability mechanisms that are, act, can be activated right away where there's a failure of delivery of service. And so, um, Minister Tishere, I know that you have a, there's a hotline, and I'm wondering to what extent is that hotline linked, for example, to a complaints mechanism? So if I go to the police station and I don't get the response, the police say, well, you're a sex worker anyways, and we're, you know, we're not or you're a migrant woman and you're here illegally and we are not giving you service, that there's some place immediately that a victim can go for protection and for some response. And I'm wondering if the hotline is that place and also what is the thinking of the state on how it strengthens the, the immediate accountability uh, system. And, and if, if Guyana can crack that, I think that would be a really great example um, for many parts of the, of the Americas and the Caribbean. So, I might think my main question is a question on the oversight, the accountability of uh, state actors, and the very difficult issue of state actors in remote areas. I mean, Guyana is quite large, and the regions um, are quite far flung. I would like to hear both civil society and the state um, to maybe have a reflection on how that can be supported. How can you get services to people in remote areas, and what might the alternatives? It could be a digital a digital response, for example, you know, um, having some sort of way that you can immediately communicate and get some guidance how to get to safety if you're in, in harm's way. But I would, would welcome some thinking from both civil society and the state about how the state is, how, 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 are the, how is the state and how is civil society dealing with the vastness of Guyana, um, where there's often difficult ways, difficulty to get to, to, um, to, to areas, to service areas. And for the civil society, um, the, the Women and Gender Commission has a complaints mechanism. My question is, does it have a complaints mechanism? And if it does, is that, some, that a mechanism that civil society organizations can use to activate a response? Um, so uh, I want to also congratulate the state on the, well, again, on the family law the family, the family law, the Family Violence Act, and also, uh, Minister Teixeira, the, the, you've brought up the Summary Jurisdiction Act to amend the law in relation to cross-dressing criminalization, and I wasn't sure if that was act that actually has happened yet or, or not. Yes, yes, okay. So with that, these are our questions. Um, uh, I would like to, first of all, we turn over to the civil society organizations 10 minutes for your response, and then the state will have 10 minutes for its response. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam President. Um, with respect to um, the question of Commissioner Polito, uh, the um, recommendations that we would want to um, immediately address would be uh, intentionally strengthen the process to hold duty bearers accountable for mistreatment towards migrants, transgender, and sex workers and other vulnerable groups. Now we've heard the state um, uh, presentation which addressed the issue of what are the policies in place and what are the systems and the organizations that are in place to assist. Uh, the question in our, in our mind um, would be 
uh, the duty, the persons who are accountable, are they, are they um, uh, following those uh, processes and procedures that are um, at their disposal to ensure that we do not have um, um, the mistreatment um, of migrants, trans and transgender and sex workers. And the other, um, one of the other uh, provisions, recommendations that we would like to make is to enforce the constitutional rights to housing, education, employment, and equal protection before the law for transgender Guyanese. Um, we know for a fact, and the, um, we have seen the reports um, from the state where their, the housing drive is, is presently um, uh, ongoing, and but the question for um, specific and vulnerable groups, are they also being um, time, uh, timely and uh, treated in the manner in which they also feel that they are include, included in, in the process? Um, we would like to um, see reform all the legal provisions which affect the rights of transgender people. We have a tendency to um, pick a particular legislation and and we address it, we amend it, or we, we try to fix, but do we holistically address all the legislative provisions across um, the, the, the existing legal provisions so that um, one is not fixed and the other, um, the discriminatory provisions may be there. Holistically, um, the, the uh, commission, the Legal Reform Commission, Law Reform Commission, um, should undertake to um, holistically address all the legislative provisions. And so across the board, uh, we can see all the relevant provisions are being uh, addressed at the same time. Um, the, other, uh, the other recommendation specifically would be to take immediate steps to legislate for explicit, explicit protections against stigma and discrimination. Now, oftentimes we see um, the word harassment being dis discussed and described um, uh, in the provisions, and the question is, you know, um, our the persons who use the provisions against uh, persons who complain often offer their own interpretation as to what the provision means to them, and therefore on that basis, they uh, meet out to persons complaining what they think and what is their interpretation of how they should um, take complaints or treat with persons who report to them. I'll also ask um, my, uh, the CSO members to um, now make their... Go ahead, I can start. Um, hello, um, just uh, uh, some quick ones from me. I was exceedingly happy to hear Minister Tashira talk about the frameworks that we have in place and the child advocacy centers and the fact that we work in multidisciplinary teams. So I'm very happy to report that all sources of violence is reported to the police and is within our systems. Um, what I was wondering about was obviously there's a breakdown in communication and maybe how things are recorded in the systems. And we are happy to be part of that solution to ensure that the reports are kind of recorded in a way that is very transparent for all agencies. So um, that's very, very, very good um, for me to hear. With regards to policies, we do have a national protocol for child advocacy center, multidisciplinary teams, um, that can be strengthened and actually um, broadened to include migrants because it was set up quite a number of years ago. And uh, myself and colleague from the other NGO, Child Link, we have been pushing to get this protocol um, amended and updated. So again, we would welcome having that done as soon as possible. With regards to the multi-agency coordinating body, we would be, as NGOs do not sit, or civil society do not sit on that um, body, so we would ask that we are invited to that body, and in this way, I think communication would improve as it pertains to the reporting of cases uh, or the correct reporting so that there's a transparency so we understand that this number relates to migrants, this number relates to sex workers, this number relates to trans. I think that would help to, um, yeah, the transparency in the system and to also understand where the numbers come from. Um, 
Yeah, and that's it from me. So I really look forward to, um, to putting these things in place with government. Thank you. Madam President, thank you for allowing us this time to engage. Um, and to Commissioner Carlos Budillo, and to your questions, I would like to say that we talk about, when we talk about violence from other people, we also must recognize that when violence comes from the institution, it also translates to violence from other people. And so we hear the minister here um, talk about all the wonderful things that they're doing, which I do co commend them. But we have not heard them talk about repealing the anti sodomy laws that affects directly affects transgender LGBTIQ people and lead to these types of violence from other people, lead to the institutions acting the way they act and the institutional actors denying people of their basic rights. Um, in terms of how can civil society and the state collaborate, I think we need to be intentional in, in these collaborations and what, we, what, what, what is the purpose here. I think that a lot of time people are being tokenized. Um, this government can be recognized as one of the most diverse governments in place, that's rightfully so. But then what are the specific ways in which you're protecting these diverse community in the event, let's say for example, government change, what remains for our communities? Um, for example, one would be repealing the laws that affect LGBTIQ people, especially transgender people, um, enforcing the right to work that applies to all citizens. Transgender women cannot have employment in Guyana and other places. And also explicitly protecting transgender people, explicitly protecting LGBTIQ people within the legal framework. So we talk about the family law and these things, but there's no provision that says L these provisions are applicable to LGBTIQ people. They're broad and they're subject to the interpretation of those who enforce them or who apply them. And so we need explicit protections. Um, in terms of the, gen the Women and Gender Equality Commission, we, I know personally that a commissioner who sits on that commission is outspokenly homophobic and transphobic and this can serve as a, a deterrence to making complaints to that um, thing. I'm happy that the minister referenced that no reports were made, but since she's referenced this, I will encourage transgender people to start making reports to that commission and follow them and see what, what becomes of them. There are other mechanisms like the Police Complaints Authority that when you lodge complaints there, if sometimes the files are being stolen, sometimes they disappear, or sometimes you just don't know, you can't follow up. So. Um, I do look forward to continuous dialogue with the state. I, I think we, Guy Guyana has a lot of frameworks that has ability to protect people, um, but we, we just need to be very serious in, and, 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 and mm -hmm. strategize in ways that, that are very sustainable mm -hmm. and protect us in the way that, that benefits us in, in, in some way and contributes to our social and economic well-being. Mm -hmm. Good morning again. Um, as it relates to the question asked by Commissioner Carlos Bernal Toledo, um, I think he asked about sor other sources of violence other, um, other than within the state. Um, there is a lot of violence being committed by clients, by intimate partners, and by employers, um, for example, in the, those sex workers that work in the mining communities. Um, so those are other sources of violence. I, I could not have um, missed the part where Minister Tashir shared that there were no reports of um, violence against migrants or sex workers. Um, I do agree with my colleague, which says that um, perhaps the information was not specific. I can recall in 2020, um, 2023, um, the Guyana police reported a total of 1,622 domestic violence cases. I'm so sorry, your time oh. is up too. Oh, sure. Yes, just finish your sentence. Um, but yeah. in the same year, 2022, GSWC, yeah. through the UNHCR, we um, had 17 cases reported to the police force uh, through case management services of um, mm -hmm. violence against migrant women. Thank you for that clarification. 
Uh, Minister Teixeira, over to the state. And, <coughs> yes. Yeah, thank you very much, Madam President. Um, and I think all of this shows some very important issues. When we try to combat any evil in our society, we have to work together and we have to share information. It cannot be reserves. One of the issues in Guyana and one of the strengths of its policies and programs, laws, that it has been consistent in expanding and strengthening all the time. But we also need to recognize that participation inclusion between govern governments and civil society state institutions require an open book, open disclosure, in that civil societies, if they are funded by the government and they're having problems with a particular issue, such as uh, discrimination or violence against migrants, transgender and, and uh, LGBTQI, should be using the mechanisms available to report that. Otherwise, the system collapses. You can have, we can have the 914 hotline, we can have uh, the iMatter GY app, but if we don't have a timely reporting to the institutions of the state that are responsible according to the international treaty obligations as well as the Constitution of Guyana, we have a responsibility to answer. That is true. And we do so unapologetically, and we shall do so. However, we can't try to do some of these programs with one hand behind our backs. When the NGOs come before here and say that they've had so many hundred cases in four years and so many cases in others, but they have not used the mechanisms available, especially if they're getting funding from the government. Reporting to the police is one thing, but they all know that the Ministry of Human Services is the lead ministry, and the minister in particular, Dr. Vindya Prasad, has an open door. She's not difficult to reach or to speak to. If there's any case that is falling through the cracks because of the police or because some social worker has not been supportive, etc., this is a small society with less than 800,000 people. We don't need to have a bureaucratic approach. And therefore, if we really truly want to have a reduction and elimination of violence against women, we have to not have reservoirs where we keep information for our use, but not for the benefit of the victims. There are multiple layers, Madam President, in Guyana of engagements with civil societies in formal ways, such as the, uh, in, uh, the ministerial. Advisory Committee on TIPS, the National Stakeholders Forum, the Women and Gender Equality Commission, as well as the other rights commissions, in case there's an issue of race and gender, then it goes to the Ethnic Relations Commission, for example. If it is Indigenous women, it goes to the Indigenous Peoples Commission, etc. There are multiple layers in our society. We've deliberately created that as complaint mechanisms and redress for domestic issues. If there is a commission that has a commission that's prejudiced, the commission is in, expected to be impartial as the IACHR is expected to be as a constitutional body that is protecting the constitution of our country. And therefore, when to answer my uh, the commissioner from Suriname, one has to have participation and communication but it's on a timely basis. One, that if you find a case, not to hold four, four years cases and come to the ISHR with that. We don't have that information. How are we supposed to act and to take these matters seriously? In fact, under the point that was raised by on regards to the Sexual Offenses Act, Madam, from Suriname, the amendment has not been made. We wrote extensively to the ISHR on the issue of the amendments to the Sexual Offenses Act, and that the we made it clear this is a democratic consultative process. We're not finished the act yet, amending it. And the issue that you raised to do with time limit, under the Sexual Offenses Act, there is no time limit. 
there is no time limit of when someone can bring a report of a sexual offense. There's none. So please do not be occupied with that. That is not, that was in a draft that was public and was debated and will not go into the final version. The, the issue of persons accessing services is the 914, for example, and the iMatter GY uh, app, which allows a victim to just press a button and they will be able to reach the 914 without having internet uh, available. To talk about um, legal amendments, there's the Constitutional Reform Commission, which has been set up and will be looking probably over the next two years at constitutional reforms. The Law Reform Commission was established and reappointed, and that is going through the laws of Guyana as requested and looked at by one of the members of the civil society. But I want to repeat, there's no statute on sexual offenses being brought to the courts. I want to make one comment quickly to do with the issue of the Constitution. Um, the Constitution of Guyana, whilst the issue of prostitution is not legal in Guyana, Article 149A of the Constitution guarantees the right to work. So that that right is guaranteed and it does not, and it states that no person shall be hindered in the enjoyment of his or her right to work. That is, to say, the right to free choice of employment. This is a fundamental right allowing a person aggrieved to seek redress before the High Court. When approaching the court, they are guaranteed protection of the law under Article 149. And therefore, these are fundamental issues, and that is why it's important for the civil society organizations if they need assistance being briefed and guided on the laws of Ghana, we're more than willing, as different ministries with different responsibilities, to be able to assist. And that is why I refer to the training programs that the Ministry of Home Affairs had and other agencies with uh, groups representing migrant women, transgender, and LGBTQI. The, the manager of the Ghana Gen, sorry, gender-based violence unit of the ministry has confirmed uh, in the meeting now that no reports and case information has been shared with the Ministry of Human Services um, with regards to the 174 cases mentioned in Region 7 by Blossom, for example. And so the long and short of it, Madam Chairperson, is that we have a lot of good things in our fr framework to eliminate uh, violence. But we also have to recognize that there are various factors and variables contributing to level of domestic and sexual violence in our society and in any society. Many including, many of these variables include social, cultural, religious, power relations between men and women and economic. And no society yet has been able to eliminate violence against women. We're all at different levels of uneven development. We're trying many, many things, many programs, many policies, many programs. The government doesn't only do policies and legislation. It has programs recognizing that many of the NGOs do not have the, the national, uh, what do you call, spread. And therefore, we work with NGOs on particular issues. The Ministry of Labor, for example, when an issue was raised about complaints, if there are complaints regarding Ministry of Labor, or regarding discrimination of people who are working, whether they are sex workers, whether they're transgender, etc., the Ministry of Labor has a complaints desk that you can make representation and they can make representation to, for the victim of that discrimination or harassment. And so, the Ministry of Labor, the Guyana Geology and Mines Commission operates in the interior and the mining areas. And where there are accusations of uh, attacks, hostility, interpersonal violence, targeting women, they are the ones that are closest to the ground and those reports can be made to them as well. So there are layers and layers of areas where you can complain. As I said, people have prejudices, but are the policies prejudicial? against persons with, who are migrants in Guyana. The fact that I read from the IOM 
reported 2023. Migrants are also being able to work in Guyana, and they're very visible in the construction and hospitality, hospitality sectors, as well as creating small businesses and self-employment. The majority of migrants in Guyana have been very, very entrepreneurial and very much about starting a new life and maybe finally staying here and living here for the rest of their lives. Who knows? But I believe that in closing, I would like to say that although we're not a party to the Convention on Refugees, that we provide the necessary services and support to migrants, particularly as, as uh, education and health, free of charge, and that we continue our humanitarian policy and will continue that as needed. We want to reiterate to the ICHR that it has an important role to play in supporting these efforts, but this can only be achieved through mutual respect, constructive engagement, and a shared commitment to acknowledging the role and functions of and strengthening of national institutions. Thank you, Madam. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Teixeira. I want to close the um, the meeting with you know the reminder that we are in a historic battle to end all forms of discrimination, and in particular, cross-cutting gender gender discrimination, and it requires laws, policies, requires effective implementation, it requires the energies of civil society organizations working in concert with the state. Um, I think, uh, Minister Teixeira and representatives of civil society, Ambassador Hines, that what we, what the, I hear the civil society calling for is, is a comprehensive anti-discrimination regime. And I think that Guyana has very many elements of that already, certainly with the establishment of the range of human rights commissions in the Constitution and the range of policy frameworks in place. So I want to end with um, the, the really eloquent words of my sister, Denise, when she talks about the, the deficits translate into victims and the commission, our cent the center of our attention always is on victims and working with the states to uh, assist in providing technical support for compliance. And of course, with civil society organizations, we are attentive to your perspectives because you are monitors. Ambassador Hangs, thank you to you and your team for being here with us today. Uh, to, the, to the minister and her team in Guyana, we say thank you, as well as to civil society organizations for your trust in the institution of the commission. Thank you very much. I now bring the hearing to a close. Mm -hmm.